myself, I am Mashur uh, Alwardat, a professor of astrophysics at the Department of Applied Physics and Astronomy at the University of Sharjah, uh, located in, in Sharjah Emirates, uh, which is uh, one of the seven Emirates of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, University of Sharjah is the biggest one according to the number of students uh, in UAE. And we have a Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences, and Technology. So uh, we have a, a master program uh, for uh, Astronomy and Space Sciences, another master program for uh, GIS and Remote Sensing, another uh, program uh, which is this, uh, the atom atmosphere and space law, and we are working. We are working now on a fourth one on aerospace dynamics. My talk will be about Alwardat's method for analyzing binary and multiple stellar systems. Uh, I will start with some outlines. I think uh, I have uh, this than hour, this than an hour to finish. So I'll try, I'll try to do it by. Maximum by 2.45 and to uh, keep some time for questions. Okay, importance of binary stars. Why we are talking about binary stars? Why we are interested actually about binary stars, sources of stellar parameters, uh, methods uh, of orbital analysis, and uh, like Tocqueville's method and Dukov's method, uh, and what that spectrophotometric method, uh, why spectrophotometry? What do we mean by it? And what is speckle interferometry? What's the difference between these things? What is that atmospheres modeling? How do we use it? And uh, how do you combine all these things in order to estimate the physical and geometrical properties in addition to the uh, atmospheric uh, parameters of these uh, individual components, which are members of the binary or the multiple stellar system uh, Either both. Uh, so, why binary systems? And when we talk about binary systems, not only binary stars now, we are talking about binary and multiple stellar systems. Uh, because the analysis of stellar uh, binary systems is the most reliable and accurate way of estimating stellar phys physical and geometrical parameters. So, we cannot know, we don't have any other way to find exactly, to, to calculate exactly the mass without looking to a uh, binary or a multiple stellar system. If you just look to a single star, you will not be able to, to find any of the, let's say, uh, physical parameters except the temperature and uh, uh, luminosity. And uh, even, even when we talk about the luminosity, you need the radius. When, but when we talk about binary or multiple st stars, we have real source for such, uh, for the calculations of such elements or parameters. It emphasizes the role of binary stars in examining some physical and stellar evolutionary theories. So we have too many th theoreticians who are uh, telling us or, or uh, proposing some theories or uh, they have some equations and some ideas. We need to uh, examine these things. So we have, we, have, we have to find a lab. Our lab is the uh, binary and multiple stellar systems as the clusters uh, are work, working as, as labs for uh, other parts of uh, astrophysical uh, theories. Even high resolution uh, observation techniques like speckle interferometry and, and the modern adaptive optics, which is uh, uh, implemented now in several mid-sized telescopes are not sufficient to determine the physical and uh, geometrical parameters of the individual components of visual visually closed binary systems. When we talk about a closed visual binary stars or visually closed binary systems, as if you want to, to call it like this, they are very close that you cannot uh, see these binaries or multiple stellar systems as, as two stars. You see it as only one, even with big telescopes, but with some kind of high resolution techniques, we can deduce, we can detect that there's uh, a doublicity in this uh, system and we can measure the delta magnitude and the, the separation between them and the, the tilt angle. Uh, so nearby stellar populations are occupied by mainly by dwarfs like FG 
اف جي كي اف اف جي كي ام or uh, such late type stars with metallicities in the range between minus one up to plus 0.3 uh, ME over H. Uh, more than 50% of these stars are members of binary and multiple stellar systems. This number, which is the, this percentage, 50%, if I go back to uh, 20 years ago, this number was about 40 or 35. Now it's more than 50. And some of the specialists in this field, usually they say there's no single stars. Uh, as Belega said, one of the specialists in this field, there's uh, no uh, single stars. There, there are uh, unstudied stars. So these single stars could be uh, actually binary or multiple stellar systems. Otherwise, we have uh, to find uh, some technique to study these uh, binaries or multiple stellar systems. So the effect of binary stars on statistical dependencies, uh, it, of course, it has uh, uh, a big effect because unresolved binaries are usually excluded from observation programs and statistical analysis of normal stars. So they, we, we think that these stars are single stars, but actually they are binaries. So there's uh, a miss in the number of the stars in the whole galaxy. There's a miss in the uh, overall statistical uh, uh, outcomes. So, however, big part of the unrecognized multiple systems can significantly change dependencies such as mass luminosity relation or the mass radius relation, the age luminosity, and even the scale of uh, effective temperature. So, the role of complex studies. Uh, a complex means it, you, you study the system from different aspects, from different sides, use, uh, different sites using, using different techniques. Uh, a complete study, I you know, say complex, complete study. So the complex study of binary and multiple stellar systems by different observational and computational methods have in principle significant importance in the determination of the main features of the different types of stellar populations in the galaxy. Uh, that's why we, we are focusing on these kinds of stars. So binary stars and the estimation of fundamental parameters, it gives us uh, a unique possibility for the direct determination of the complete set of stellar parameters without depending on any statistical relations. So we do it directly. The only mission which has more observations than spectral interferometry is Hipparchus. But now, as you all know, we have the new Gaia Space Telescope which uh, now uh, the, the, the third release uh, was uh, released a few weeks ago uh, with a huge number of their observations and data. So we have Hipparchus, uh, which was in, launched in uh, 1989 and uh, the mission ended in 1993, but the catalog was uh, published in 1997 and uh, um, uh, Van Leeuwen Reanalyzed the data and uh, he republished the, the catalog in 2000, 2007. And now we are talking about not only Hipparchus, also Gaia, but it had this Hipparchus low, lower accuracy, larger limited separation, and insufficient mission lifetime, only three years uh, for reconstructing the orbits. Not enough, we are talking about periods of around uh, uh, tens of years. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the, or the, the period of, of these uh, binaries. So historically, we know that uh, there's a, some, some star called Algol, uh, an Algol constellation, a series is a binary also with a, a white dwarf nearby it. Uh, in, the, in the 19th century telescopes with, came with higher resolution so we could see that these stars act are actually not single stars, they are binaries. In the 20th century, new methods of high resolution, like occultation, spectral interferometry, which was uh, um, introduced to astronomy in, in the 17th. Uh, so we are talking about uh, around 50 years of using spectral interferometry. Adaptive optics, we are talking about, uh, it was introduced in the 19th. So we're talking about 30 years of using adaptive optics and space telescopes which are uh, now uh, we have very high resolution, very good quality with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope and Gaia Space Telescope. 
nowadays more special resolution fast bcs uh, bigger telescopes more space missions so we have a lot to do we we have just started astronomy and astrophysics that's what i always say to my students we are on the first step in our science so you have too many things to do you have vast um, space in front of you in this in this science so what's what are the sources of stellar parameters so we have direct measurements like observations we can measure magnitudes like m1 m2 m3 parallax positional measurement like rho and theta when we say positional measurement the, the, the primary star and the secondary star what's the separation between them and what's the angle this is the uh, this is the rho and this is the theta the angle so we have polarimetry to to have an idea about uh, the magnetic fields on these stars so just that this is from observations what about the, the, the rest of the fundamental parameters which we use in astrophysics how can we uh, get these uh, parameters so we have to to find another way so we call it the calculated or the estimated we have magnitude difference Keller indices u minus b b minus v v minus r and so on orbital parameters or elements depending on laws and equations of astrophysics uh, and we have the estimated which uh, when we talk about estimating everything else these things so uh, let's start with the methods of orbital analysis as the orbital parameters uh, represent an uh, important part of the parameters uh, as a whole so we have the estim estimating the orbital limits we have this figure which shows the uh, tilt of the of the orbit of the star the secondary around the primary so we call it the relative orbit this degree one the relative orbit this is the the red one uh, 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 coincide with the line of sight uh, and uh, we have these elements, we have the same major axis, the, this, the, the angle uh, and uh, the angle of the nodes. Uh, 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 and uh, so we have the, uh, what we call the inclination and so on. So all these, this, uh, uh, what we call it, uh, orbital elements. So period, uh, epoch of passage, uh, at what time it will uh, Pass through the pre-astron pre point, uh, eccentricity, uh, semi-major axis, position angle of the line of nodes, longitude of the pre-astron uh, in degrees. Uh, this is omega small. If we go back, this is omega small. You see, this is the the line of nodes from the line of nodes to the pre-astron line. This one uh, and the inclination of the orbit. And here we have this the inclination. This is the, the red, as I told you, the line of sight, coincide with the line of sight. So, uh, and we have speckle interferometry. Speckle interferometry, I did, I did that in my PhD uh, around uh, two, between 2000 and 2004. So, uh, in this, uh, 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 what we call it, uh, this is for unresolved star and this is for a resolved binary. Uh, of course, you will not be uh, able to, do, to distinguish between the two images. This is just one frame, 20 milli arc second exposure only. When we usually observe such stars with spectral interferometry, we do more than 1,500 frames for each star. Uh, and we, after that, do the, what's, what's called the reduction. In the reduction, we have the uh, diffraction uh, limit uh, resolution. Uh, it seems that we have a problem. Okay. Okay, there's a file, missed, missed file here. Okay, uh, and we have the, uh, for the six meter uh, telescope, if we want to, to calculate the diffraction limit. When we say about diffraction limit, it means that um, how far two stars from each other that this observatory, this telescope, can resolve can resolve them. So when we when you look at a, a car in the night during the night, away from you, uh, when you look to the, to the front light of this car, uh, if it's too far from you, you will see it as one one light. But 
by the time it, it, it becomes closer to you, you will be able to resolve the two lights. This is what we call the resolution power of your eye. If you use your uh, eyes, it will be uh, uh, farther distance. So the resolution power, you resolve the, the, the two lights, let's say at one kilometer, but using one eye, you reserve, resolve the two lights at 700 meters and so on. So we, ha we have the number of speckles, which is uh, related to the, to the atmospheric turbulence. What we are doing here, we want to get rid of the turbulence in the atmosphere, uh, to get rid of the uh, effect of the atmosphere. And we have Fred's constant, which is the R0, 10 centimeters at the lambda 500 nanometer. Uh, so using the Laperi method, which was uh, introduced by Laperi in 1970, 1971, something like that, uh, with Fourier transformation, we can get the uh, power spectrum and the autocorrelation function. So from this autocorrelation function, we can uh, know that this is a binary star and we can measure the, the, the theta between the two stars, uh, this, the line which connects the two stars, and the distance between them, which we call rho. And these are the, the equations which we use for the reduction and for the autocorrelation method or technique. So, uh, it should work this one now, unfortunately. I may use it from another side, okay. But just give me a second, please. I want to. Want to uh, this, is, this is fine, okay. I missed, I missed the sorry the file uh, it seems somewhere I, I will I will come back to it if I didn't get it now. It shows how, how the reduction uh, or the process of the reduction here. Uh, so we have here port draconis. This is a binary and this is a binary, but this one wasn't resolved by the six meter telescope. So we used here the six meter telescope for this observations. The six meter telescope couldn't of uh, resolve the 40 draconis, but we know it, that it is a binary from spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is a complementary method for uh, knowing that this is a binary or a multiple stellar system or whatever. Uh, but this one is quite clear. We have the autocorrelation function and the power spectrum of the autocorrelation function quite clear here that it's a binary. So this is the six meter telescope. You can see two persons are standing here. It's a huge thing, 1,100 tons which are moving as one piece. Um, really, really huge uh, construction. So uh, the limiting magnitude for this kind of observations is 15 magnitudes only with such big telescope. Yes, the seeing at that area is between 1 and 1.5 arc seconds and the resolution uh, for a binary, it's 20 milli arc seconds. This is the camera which we used. Uh, and it's a big one, more than a meter long, one meter long. And uh, we have um, uh, electron uh, gainer here. Uh, and uh, we have a detector. At that time, it was uh, at the beginning of the use, of, the use of, the, of using the CCDs in, in astronomy. Uh, it was really expensive. And these are the filters which we used. So some examples of the results to, to start with, uh, 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 this is this is a comparison between between the adaptive optics and the spectral interval material. This to the right, using adaptive optics, the same star using adaptive optics, but this one using spectral interval material. So adaptive optics gives you a direct imaging, uh, a very clear uh, image of the star, without the need for uh, such uh, complicated data reduction. But for spectral interferometry. I know it's a bit complicated, but it's also very precise. Uh, you get a huge data each night, giga, uh, gigas of bytes, but uh, at the end you will find 
yourself doing like this. So the crosses and the dots and the triangles here are the observations among several years. So this binary, uh, I think this one, 41 Draculas, this binary, binary star was uh, being observed uh, since 1993 up to 2002, these, uh, these observations. Uh, and using these observations, we could build the orbit of the uh, secondary around uh, the primary or what, what we call the, the relative uh, orbit. <coughs> this, uh, again, for the Draculas using high resolution spectroscopy. So, uh, how do we build uh, uh, the, the uh, orbits of these stars? So, we have two different methods. We have Tukhvini's method for orbital analysis, which depends on the least square method. And we have Zukov, we have the Kobo's method for orbital analysis. This guy, this professor, is a, a originally Russian, but now he's working in in Chile in the city. Uh, 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 and uh, Dukovo, Dukovo is, is a professor at uh, San, uh, uh, sorry, um, San Diego, uh, sorry, uh, uh, northern, northern, northern of Spain, uh, northwest of Spain. Uh, I have to remember the name of the department, his department. And I, I worked with him as uh, just a visitor there for one month or so. And uh, in his method, analytical method, he needs only three points to resolve the, or to, to build the orbits. But here we can use as much uh, available points as possible. So we use the, actually, I, I, I use this one. Uh, I use this one, I use this one uh, for a few papers, but uh, each time we want to use it, we have to go back to the Kobo, but it's not published his uh, method yet. Uh, so, uh, you have uh, for for Tukunin's one. This this is the the subroutine or the uh, scheme for using uh, Tukunin's method. Tukunin's method is available free for anyone who wants wants to use it. So what you what you need to to insert for the uh, uh, this kind of programs, you need rho and theta, and you will get the. Uh, of course, the orbit, but you need to do some uh, pre-calculations in order to, to understand how it works. And finally, you need to print out the uh, X to, to, to reprote the two orbits, the old one and the new one. You may even do uh, an orbit for the first time, but it needs an uh, experience. So the Cobus method is uh, explained here in this paper from 1985. And uh, uh, this is another one. And how or where can we find the data to, to build the orbits? This is the source for the, the data. We have the fourth catalog. And when you build an orbit, you publish it in the sixth catalog. So each year or each month, we have uh, an update of the data on the fourth catalog and on the sixth catalog. So if you go there, you will find my name, you will find the name of the code, you will find the name of our professor. Uh, my professor in the PhD. So, if you, even my students now have names here uh, because they built some, uh, they built some 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 orbits of stars, of stars, and you can do it. Uh, you can write when once you do a solution or you solve an orbit, just try to do Kobo. The the Kobo is responsible for the website of updating the orbits. So, as an example. We have here, uh, I, I wrote here the, the years. This is, uh, if we go back until 1997, 1998, 1999, and so on. This is the, so this is the, the, the primary star, the primary star is here in the, on, on the origin. And this shows, this figure shows the, the two orbits, the old one against the, the, the new one or the modified one. Here it shows three orbits for the star. Uh, using uh, uh, the method. This is from Balek in 2001, and that's 2003, and another work for this paper. Uh, so there's no any direct way to calculate the parameters of individual components. We want to know what is the mass of this individual component? What's the size? What's the temperature? Uh, Logarithm G, all these things. How to know that? So the best way is the estimation of these parameters using an indirect way, the computational method. 
One of these methods, and it could be the only one in the case of closed visual binary and multiple stellar systems, is Elwardat's method for analyzing binary uh, and uh, uh, multiple stellar systems. So the scheme for the uh, method is that uh, we have to calculate uh, manually, or I have uh, some, some tables and under origin or under, uh, you can uh, change it under uh, Excel if you want. Uh, you will get uh, uh, delta magnitude from from uh, from spectral interferometry, from adaptive to any 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 source, zero variation or source. The delta magnitude between the two stars, and the whole magnitude for the for the binary. So, from this you can estimate the flux for the first one and the flux for the second one. From this you can calculate the temperature for the first one and the temperature for the second one, and look at the energy as an as a primary or a pre preliminary input for the method. Here we use Atlas 9. Atlas 9 gives you the model atmospheres for a single star. But we have two stars or three or four or five or six sometimes. Now we work on, uh, we call it a small cluster or a mini cluster, six stars in one system. So uh, after that, you build the, the, the atmosphere for the first one and the model atmosphere for the second one using Atlas 9, which is from Kourouz model atmospheres and later we use another step of the of the method which is the combination we combine both of these models together uh, knowing somehow the distance to the system the radius of the first one and the radius of the second one from which we get the spectra the, the, the spectrophotometrical data we call the spectral energy distribution for the first one for the second one and for the whole system if we got this we can calculate what's called sensitive photometry, from which we uh, calculate U, V, V, uh, U minus V, B minus V, for Johnson, Stromgen, Tycho, and even Gaia now. Uh, we, uh, once we got these things, we can compare to the observations. If we got a fit, that means, okay, these parameters represent our system, represent our system. Otherwise, we go back in an iteration technique until we get the best fit. The iteration could reach 100 times, 200 times, it depends on the, uh, the way, how do you calculate the parameters. Uh, you understand for the astrophysical process, the astrophysical uh, case of these stars, is it a binary or a multiple? You need to know, sometimes nobody uh, uh, mentioned if it's a, a binary or a multiple stellar system. So in this case, we what we did actually at the beginning, we, I, I got some uh, spectra as spectrophotometry. The, using this, this spectrophotometer, a huge one, we used here uh, liquid nitrogen for cooling the, the camera. And uh, the, the advantage of this spec graph is that you can widen the slit in order to, to, to have the whole light of the star. So. This is the, uh, the uh, these are the parameters or the description of the, the spec graph, and this is the CCD uh, sensitivity curve, and uh, this is the spectrum. Of course, if you compare it to the Chile, this is Chile spectrum, and this this is the what. Uh, now, at the Sharjah Observatory, we have two spec graphs. One is the uh, compact Chile, and uh, the other one is uh, like this one. It gives us the whole spectrum low resolution or uh, medium to low resolution, we call it DADUS. Both of them, we bought it from uh, Germany, from uh, uh, Bader company, uh, uh, and we used uh, both of them. Uh, in order to do spectrophotometry, you need standard stars, but if you are doing high resolution spectroscopy, you don't need stars sometimes. You are focusing on specific lines, on the, on the shift of the line to the red part, to the blue part, it depends what you are going to do, what you want to study. But if you are doing spectrophotometry, you need photometric lights, you need standard stars, you need a very accurate data reduction. So the data acquisition, I wrote here some rules, how to get the data. You need to be sure that the whole star is within the slit. Uh, you can use the wider one. Uh, some spectrographs have uh, three slits or two slits at least. Uh, data detection can be done under Midas, IRAF, or uh, now um, Chiliac uh, company 
also published another uh, subroutine for uh, data detection under Windows. Uh, Demetra called Demetra. It's, I think it's good. We are now trying to use it uh, because most of the students uh, they don't use uh, Linux. They they usually prefer uh, Windows. Uh, so uh, once you've got the uh, data analyzed, you you get you get what's called the spectrophotometry or the uh, this spectrum. So I did, uh, after that, we, we get the BVR filters as a transparency table or curve or data, and we multiply it by the spectrum to get the synthetic photometry. So these, these spectra were uh, taken at the one meter telescope uh, at SAO in Russia and the Caucasian mountains. And we have a new, of course, at our observatory in, in Sharjah. Uh, these are the main lines which we uh, use to to uh, to be to be sure that uh, uh, we are in the right position. And this is the the Sharjah Observatory. Uh, we have the biggest one, 17 inch uh, telescope. Uh, so we attached uh, the spectrograph here, and uh, this is the data spectrograph for the wide range, low resolution. Uh, it's quite good and easy to use and light one. You can use it even with a 14 inch telescope. Uh, even uh, this is the spectrum at the beginning when we get it, you can see here, but this one needs another step, which is the data reduction uh, to, to the end the calibration for the standard star. Uh, once we get the spectra calibrated, we can use this equation uh, to calculate the magnitude, like MV, MB, BV, B minus V. You can, we can do anything using this. And I have subroutine under IDL. And the right, we have several subroutines. Once you multiply the filter, the, this filter, which you saw it now here, uh, like this one, BVR, multiplied by this one, you will get this. Okay, since so this is the multiplication of B, multiplication of V, multiplication of R. What we do next is to calculate the area under this curve. Uh, once you calculate the area, you divide it by that calculated for the Vega as the center star. You can get the, the spectra of Vega from the internet. Uh, this is the way how do we uh, spectrophotometry. I have the whole subroutines for that. So these are some, some results here uh, and the, the tables for the results. And uh, one of the applications, how uh, we do synthetic photometry or spectral interferometric binaries. This one was published in 2008 as a recalculation uh, using the new uh, zero points. And this is a comparison between uh, my work and Hipparchus magnitude, even you can see the consistency between the two works. And this is for B minus V. So the Earth's atmosphere, absolutely, you have heard a lot about the effect of Earth's atmosphere. I will not go to this part, I will leave it to my colleagues, okay? Uh, I will leave it, but here we have Schiele spectra. If you don't know this star, is, is it a binary or no? You can observe it using high resolution spectroscopy. If, if both stars are uh, uh, at the line of sight, the, the, the tilt of the orbit and the collision is very small. So you can, you can uh, in this case, you can measure and the, the orbit is, is somehow, they are orbiting fast around each other. You can measure Th these, these two lines that represent, each line represent a star. This is, for, this is the, for the primary and this is for the secondary. This is for 40 dra 41 dragons. This is for another star, 40 dragons. This is the primary and the secondary here. So the primary is red shifted here and the secondary is blue shifted. So the primary is going away from us and the, the, the secondary is uh, uh, forwarding uh, to us. Uh, now, this comparison between the Atlas V, the old one, this is the, the thing, and the observations, the dots, my observations, Atlas 9, the new one, the black line, and uh, the components A or B, this one. So this represents component A or B because delta magnitude is zero for this star, HD25811. By the way, using my technique, uh, I got the, the distance to the star without uh, observations. And later Gaia observed the star and assured my result, which was done in 2010. Uh, the, the, it was within the error of the measurement. So the method can be used to, to find even not only the parameters, the, the physical and geometric, 
can be used to, to, to find the distance to the star if you know that is such a uh, subgiant star or uh, I mean sequence star, just tell me and I'll tell you the rest. So, uh, so it's a combination. The method is a combination between speculative and interferometric results like orbit elements, magnitude difference, which is the most important and absolute magnitudes with the spectrophotometry, atmospheres modeling, and we got all these things. This is the method, uh, how the method works. So depending on the comparison and the best fit between the entire observational spectral energy distribution and the synthetic SEDs created by the atmospheric modeling of the components of the binary system or the multiple stellar system using grids of groups, Atlas 9, 1994, blanketed models. Of course, there are some other models, but I like that groups because of the, the lines they he used, okay? Uh, so these are the main equations which I use. This is the, the box here is for the sun uh, by our sun and by our sun. You know the, sort of these equations, but this one represents my method, which is the combination. It combines the, the, the spectra from the first star with that from the second star. If I have a, a third component or a fourth component, of course, this equation uh, is a, a series become a series. And uh, uh, here are some of the, the publications. This was in 2007. And of course, you can find the publications on more than 20 publications in, in this field. The last one was in the Astro 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 Astronomical Journal uh, for one of my uh, master's students who already finished his degree. And even I can um, solve the problem for the uh, late type stars. This is a late type star, you can see. Uh, combine, combining a, a, a star, so red star combining a blue star. It's really complicated to do that, but I did it for nine signals. And this is another, uh, you can see the fit between the, the entire observation and the entire flux, the, the theoretical one or the synthetic one. Uh, so, this is uh, this, the, the system which I told you about, uh, and we, we get the distance to this star uh, with the error value, uh, with a, uh, very precisely within the error value when Gaia measured the distance to the star. The most important thing that we can plot the positions of these components on the evolutionary tracks and on the age given of these stars, we can estimate the age and even the metallicity now. So we can, I can tell you the metallicity, the age of the star, the, the uh, mass of the star from these position, the positions of, of these stars on the HR diagrams. It's another uh, uh, star also. So uh, these are subgiants. So, uh, and as you, you, we all know that subgiant stars usually are not well studied in astrophysics. Uh, so the benefit of the benefits of the method, I, I, I think I have to stop. Uh, the accuracy of the method has been approved in several papers. Uh, Albert Das method is a good tool for estimating the parallax, uh, it, uh, also for estimating the, the metallicity and also for the, for the age of the uh, system. Uh, and now we are focusing on Gaia DR2 and DR3, and we discovered that there's a problem in Gaia DR2 uh, parallax measurements, and we, we reported this in a paper published in, in PASA. Publications of Astronomical uh, Society of Australia. It was published before the release of EDR3. And once the EDR3 released, it assured our results. So we find that there's uh, at least out of the 1,700 uh, 1, stars which we studied, we found 55 systems with problems in parallax between Gaia and Hipparchus, and we need a solution. So one of the, our papers now is how to uh, report the, uh, the problem, this problem for a specific star. What's the solution for each star? We need to know which is the right one. So it's a wide field of research. Uh, this one uh, was studied using observations from our observatory at Sharjah. And uh, this is the application uh, is really in interesting. This is uh, Zahra is a, a PhD student. Uh, I'm co-supervising her. She's studying in Malaysia. Thank you very much. I have to stop here. So, actually, I have some questions from the uh, participants, please. So we have, uh, yeah. Victor, can you introduce uh, yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 
professor. Uh, my name is Victor Vukoria and I'm from Nigeria. Uh, and I really enjoyed your, your, your presentation. I, I'm just wondering, um, especially um, the, the method you, you, you're working on, which emphasized the law, the speckle interferometry. Um, there's a lot of interesting um, standards uh, I see mathematically you have developed. So I'm just wondering, uh, considering the anomalous nature of uh, the study, what's the degree of uh, accuracy and uh, how do you benchmark this accuracy? So thank you for the, for, uh, the question. Actually, uh, um, the accuracy of the method is assured by uh, the iteration. So uh, we have the observational data and we have the, the computational uh, results. Uh, we have to be very precise in using the, and, and very strict to the, to the observational data. We have the magnitude, the whole magnitude for the system, and we have the B minus V. The B minus V represent the temperature. So the B minus V for the whole system should be fixed from our, so it's, it's one of the cornerstones, one of the most important points. Don't change it. We have to, to find it exactly. The second point is the delta magnitude. Once you have the delta magnitude measured or observed, you have to uh, st st stick with it. Uh, the rest of the things, uh, it depends on the uh, uh, just error of the calculations, which um, mostly around 10% uh, of, the, of the whole amount. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there another question? Would I? No. <laughs> a question from me. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. You can introduce yourself, please. Uh, thank you, sir. My, my name is uh, Anil Banner, uh, Master 7. So, my question about uh, speed and technology. You said the uh, the, the limit of uh, resolution uh, depends on the, on the atmospheric turbulence. So if we have two telescopes who has a different diameter, if we have the same the limit of resolution? Uh, thank you for this question. It's uh, a technical question, actually. The, the resolution limit is, is uh, related to the, to the aperture of the telescope. So bigger telescope, uh, better resolution, uh, lower uh, separation between the two stars. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they used uh, what you mentioned. They used the two Keck telescopes together in, in, in Hawaii. They used it as uh, one telescope. In this case, you have 80 meters uh, diameter of the mirror, but they used as interferometry. In our uh, technique, which is speculative interferometry, we used to put two holes at the, at the uh, secondary focus. So we, we, we used to, to use a black, uh, uh, a black cover and only two holes inside this, this cover to, to make the interferometry and to get the, the data. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another question? Je pose la question. Uh, Est-ce qu'il quelles sont les suites de votre programme? Est-ce qu'il y a de les suites uh, les suites dans l'avenir? Est-ce que vous avez détecté des défaillances dans votre programme? Et quels sont les avantages? I don't know if you can understand French, so um, we can translate. Yeah, please. Yeah, the question <laughs> is from Hamid Hamastito uh, from Panji. He is asking. Uh, about your method for uh, that you're using, how how uh, what's the next and how accurate? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question actually. Um, the accuracy of the method, as, as as the first question, the accuracy of the method was proved using different kind of observations. Like, if we have uh, high resolution uh, uh, spectroscopy. We do our analysis using the method and we compare the results of the, of the uh, estimating, like estimating the masses using uh, the spectroscopy. We can estimate if we have high resolution spectroscopy, we can, we can find the orbits, we call it the spectroscopic orbit. We can find the masses and the mass ratio. Uh, so we have another, uh, for some, some systems, not for all systems. What we have done, 
Actually, at the beginning of uh, uh, working on this technique, we use different uh, ways to be sure that this method uh, is working precisely and in the right direction. Uh, regarding the ratio of the, of the error, or uh, you can just go back to the uh, please go back to the to the publications and you will find uh, a description of calculating the errors given. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mashur, that about for, for your presentation. While you were talking in your presentation, you mentioned the system, uh, the storage system HIP 101227. So uh, uh, I was just looking at the paper in front of me, uh, uh, and, and I found that's interesting that you mentioned that you found that the four stars have some uh, uh, very similar uh, uh, physical, uh, physical characteristics. And you think that this is a kind of split or, or, or fragmentation process between the stars. So how this can happen? So how you can have a star, big yeah. star to four? And what, what, Actually, what, yeah. why, why is any other hypothesis? Can we can we can we can look at, for example, I don't know immigration. I, I don't know. So I'm just like wondering how we can split a star to four stars. Okay. Thank you very much. It's really the the, the soul of the method. Now we are working on multiple star system, not on binary only. Because binary is somehow easy to, to, uh, to solve it if you know it, it's a binary. But the, what we discovered actually, like this star, this star was uh, analyzed by one of my students in the past and he realized it as a binary. But I, didn't, I wasn't convinced of his result actually. Because of the mass, I, I suspected the mass. the mass. The mass of binary should be less than the mass of such system if it's a binary. Later on, I, I asked this uh, student, a PhD student, to reanalyze it using my method. And she said, okay, there's only one solution for the system to be a quadrable system. How? Because two things. The first thing is the position of the components in the HR diagram. The second thing is the mass, uh, the masses uh, of the components and the total mass of the system. It cannot be a binary, no way to be a binary. It should be. Uh, uh, a quadruple system or that coincide with the astrophysical uh, equations and astrophysical uh, limitations. Uh, how it forms actually, this uh, it's, it's not uh, a star splitting into four uh, stars. No, it, you have to go back uh, to the time of the, of the formation from the cloud, the, the, the original cloud, when it was just uh, a huge cloud of gas uh, um, revolving around the center of mass of this cloud. At that time, what happened actually is the fragmentation and uh, fragmentation is the, the most powerful theory for the formation of binary and multiple stellar systems. And even for the solar system, the, 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 the planets fragmented from the same cloud which formed the sun at the center. So fragmentation, I am just uh, uh, supporting fragmentation against what's called capture theory. Capture theory is that there's a star and captured another star and became a binary or multiple system. Yeah, so uh, that's a lot of questions. So do you try to, um, to, to observe it with large telescope and especially with interferometry method to resolve the system or you think you need some larger telescopes? Uh, this is a good question. We need, in order to, dis to, to discover if it's uh, really quadrable uh, using the observations, we need a higher resolution technique. Hopefully with, with the James Webb telescope, we can at least detect that there's some uh, paint component there or uh, components. So we are looking forward to, to have high resolution observations. Yeah, one more last question. So do you think this kind of binary, because you described all the binary system, so um, I think that have, there's some planet found uh, around this binary system. Do you think this is, even with quadrupole system, we can find some uh, planets around them? Yes, what we call it the habitable zone. We are now, uh, second part of the research is, uh, it's one of my former uh, PhD students doing that. Uh, after we finish the analysis of the star, of the system, he just studied the habitability, habitability zone around the star and the possibility of finding a planet there. Uh, in, in this case, we go back to the observations of uh, specialized telescopes uh, for planets. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very there. much for your questions. That's okay. Another question, please. So we are in the 
end of uh, this uh, morning session, we will thank uh, Dr. Mashor, and uh, we will meet him at uh, two and a half p.m. for a practical session. And uh, uh, yeah, for can the, you, can we can we shift it to today? Sorry for because I have another. Um, can can we reschedule it for another for tomorrow or or another time for practical session because it's really uh, too hard. Okay. I have another session. Let us have a talk by WhatsApp. If, uh, okay. Um, okay. Can, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you, Mashor. Thank you. مرحبا وشكرا على تربية الحوا. الله يعطيك العافية. نتمنى فرصة قادمة تجينا نزوركم إن شاء الله. إن شاء الله. إن شاء الله. بالنسبة لل لل workshop practical يا ريت ممكن إذا بكرة أو بعد بكرة ما عندي مشكلة بس اليوم عندي طلاب لازم أكمل معهم. آه أوكي نشوفه مع المجيد ونحاول. أوكي تمام. على القوة وقت آخر إن شاء الله الله يحفظكم يبارك فيكم يا رب يا أهلا بكم نراكم على خير السلام عليكم